Hello and welcome to New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Professor Melvin Ayogo, who is uh, at the Department of uh, Business Studies at the University of Cape Town. Professor Ayogo, thank you for joining me today. Um, thank you very much. We've had many conferences uh, where we've dealt with uh, North America, we've dealt with problems with the Eurozone, we've dealt with Asia. Um, we have missed Africa. Uh, it always seems to be overlooked, and yet, in a discussion of north-south divides, inequality, it seems to me that uh, in many respects, Africa is the continent that represents the apex of these problems. Well, Africa needs to grow, like everybody else. Um, and more importantly, it needs to create jobs for its citizens because of the youth bulge in terms of demographic transition. People are born, people go to school, they want jobs, they want fulfillment like everybody else. And so in a continent that does not create jobs at um, a sufficient uh, rate to keep up with its uh, population, particularly the youthful population, it does not uh, look very uh, promising for the future. It generates uh, migration. Those kinds of migration also affect other countries. So uh, the interdependency in the globalized world is such that one part of the world cannot be growing without considering what's happening at the other end. Um, it becomes just one uh, version of the same inequality. You talk about, about income inequality. You also think about growth and uh, developmental inequalities. And so you are correct that if we're discussing inequalities in all its dimensions, we must also not forget some of the regions that are most in need of uh, this uh, miracle, if you like. And, and you uh, have uh, spoken about the problems of capital flight uh, in regards to uh, Africa. Um, given that Africa is not fully integrated into the globalized economic system, where, where, what is the, the source of that capital flight? Is it, um, is it kleptocracy or is it, uh, is it volatile portfolio flows from mm -hmm. investment flows? What do you think is driving it? Well, um, capital flight has become uh, a catch-all phrase because uh, it's common to describe illicit financial flows, which is the bigger um, uh, descript description or more apt description of what is happening. All kinds of uh, um, uh, illegalities uh, from contraband, smuggling, crime proceeds, uh, stolen public money, and people simply taking their uh, wealth outside because they think it's safer. So all those things have, been com have come to be characterized as capital flight. But <clears throat> if you look deeper, it all goes to um, bad governance. Uh, people feel uncomfortable, flights to safety, and the bad governance, of course, comes from the way in which those who are supposed to husband the fortunes of the nation run things. Uh, if you if you if you're entrusted with the fortunes and you don't manage it properly, people see what's happening and they see the consequences. And the overall effect, of course, is you have a dysfunctional state, a dysfunctional economy, and both the good and bad gets mixed up in the name of capital flight. Uh, every capital that flies is not because of illegality. Some are flights to safety. Some are, of course, mixed up with illegal proceeds leaving the continent. But the point remains. When um, resources leave a continent that needs resources, it's bad. And uh, clearly it's bad. And, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you think these problems are endemic uh, to Africa. Is there a way of solving them? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> or can one speak of the continent well, in general? it's a relative. Uh, probably the same uh, um, capital of even larger magnitude bleeds out of developed countries. Um, secrecy jurisdictions and tax havens uh, capital flight from developed countries to other developed countries. Uh, what is special, if you like, about developing regions is that they can ill afford these kinds of capital scarcity. They need massive injections of capital to uh, build infrastructure, to establish uh, industries, manufacturing, to industrialize, if you would. Uh, and so even if they were able to retain everything they generated internally, <clears throat> it would not be enough. We would still need capital inflow from developed countries. Imagine then when you're not even able to keep the capital that you generate uh, locally, uh, there is no hope because um, capital attracts capital. 
um, finance works by demonstration. Why do you think people dress up fancily in Wall Street and bankers don't look raggedy? Even if you're hungry, you gotta look the part. Nobody wants to put their money, uh, uh, with, entrust their uh, finances or fortune to somebody who looks hungry. So if you're a continent that looks like you're not going anywhere, people wouldn't want to bring investments. So we have to find a way to retain what we have to show that we are serious about investment so investors can also support that enterprise. Um, are there any countries specifically in Africa do you think that are, are eliminating that political dysfunction that are actually doing what you suggest to improving the, the, the capital investment flows and inflows? Um, because of the size of the economies, one country or two countries cannot do it. You have to look at this as a regional issue. Um, economies of scale, the scale you need for enterprise to function. You need the market, um, which means that even if one country were to get it right, it's not going to be enough. You need critical mass. So we would have to look at regions where things are happening properly. You know, if you, you are doing are there well, any regions that are working properly in, in Africa? Well, moral, not, well, if you look at ECOWAS or you look at COMESA, those are the two large regional uh, markets, you know, common markets. Um, ECOWAS has made progress. And just for the benefit of, of viewers, ECOWAS... Uh, Economic to... Community of West African States. Okay. Mm -hmm. And COMESA is Common Market of Eastern and Southern Africa. Yeah. Um, the, the countries that form these groups have, at least by taking care of cross-border movements, They've made progress, but in terms of promoting macroeconomic uh, stability and facilitating a transaction costs across the borders, including transportation, a lot still needs to be done. And if you look at the business value chain, you know that distribution, logistics and transportation is often a very large component in the value chain of manufacturing and, and selling and marketing of products. And until we can get those <clears throat> uh, transaction costs very low, it's going to be very difficult to both locate manufacturing and also sell within the continent. And you've, so you're left with this uh, ironic situation where lots of the things that are sold locally are manufactured in China. And yet we have the same excess supply, if you like, of labor as they do in China. And some, in some African countries, they're probably uh, ready to accept a lower wage in terms of <coughs> reservation wage than some of the Chinese factory workers. In fact, China's an interesting situation because one hears a lot about Chinese investment in, in Africa, countries like Angola, for example. Yes. And yet what often hear is that, um, in effect, it becomes another form of quasi-colonization because the Chinese uh, come in, they bring their own workers um, and, and uh, in effect uh, use Africa as a center for resource extraction and don't put much back into the, uh, the country's concern. Is that a fair it's, characterization? It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to knock somebody who's at least doing something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you look at the long term, it's almost very strategic. Uh, they're embedding into the culture. They bring the people, the, the workers somehow, uh, and they bring the finance and they establish basic infrastructure. And so they begin to embed into the environment. They understand the way business is done. And it helps them even strengthen their competitiveness, which makes you also worry about, is there gonna, are there going to be space in the future for local entrepreneurs when do we finally wake up? I mean, we're not sleeping, but when you get to the point in which you can establish factories and you want to compete and you want to distribute, uh, your competitors who may be foreign already know the environment as better than, as, better than you do because first they've been operating in your environment, they've been manufacturing, so they have a first move advantage. And it's fine, I mean, we need uh, some of the resources they provide at the moment. The point is we should catch up quickly before it gets to the point in which they're so embedded, there's no chance for you to even get into the market. And how do you think that's done? I mean, do you have any specific policy ideas that you'd like to see implemented? Well, it would start first by uh, reforming governance so that the leaders are more res responsive to the issues. It often um, pains me when I see that the discourse, uh, public discourse, rarely discuss the issue of unemployment. We don't have official statistics. People don't sweat it. 
And yet it's the most important thing. Kids are coming out of school, they can find jobs. And we was just discussing this in OECD. Even those who have jobs worry about the fact that their income is not sufficient for them to accumulate wealth so they can retire and put less pr pressure on public resources. And there's not social welfare nets of, of any consequence. It's not, but I'm even saying if developed countries like some of the OECD worry about these things where people have jobs, they have income, and they worry about the fact that it might not be enough, imagine those who have no jobs and no income. So um, you're chasing somebody who's running and complaining they're not running fast enough and you haven't even started. <laughs> you know? So when I look at those dynamics and the gap, you know, um, I find it very frightening. And so the level of urgency in terms of fixing governance and beginning to worry about establishing basic infrastructure and promoting business so they can create employment opportunities does not happen. And that's the ultimate. We, want, we don't want government to deliver uh, public welfare. We want government to enable private enterprise, create the jobs, because government will never create enough jobs. You know, and we don't want it to become a public works program where, as you, as you described, you ship your people off with some capital so they can go to some other place and work, anything but create jobs, because the social consequences of having the youths in the street unemployed it's very dangerous as well. I, I want to come back to the question of political governance. Um, mm -hmm. You are based in South Africa, but you're Nigerian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you think, uh, are there signs, for example, in Nigeria that we're getting it right? We've had a recent presidential election, and uh, uh, there was a transition. An incumbent actually uh, allowed himself to be voted mm -hmm. out of office. Mm -hmm. uh, does that represent progress of sorts? It is. Uh, it is it's, it's actually um, a momentous event. You know, and even those who made it happen, it's like, this could happen? Everybody had their bread, you know, because we, they were always bandied around the power of the incumbency, and you can't take it for granted. But the fact, the electorate finding out that there is some mechanism design in which we can actually hold our leaders accountable you know, by the ballot box without having to get a regime change through a military coup d'etat you know, uh, means that people will begin to take their voter registration and their uh, universal suffrage rights very seriously. And so some of them, they can now even tell the politicians, I'm watching you. If you don't deliver on some of those things you promised, come the next time around at the polls and we will punish you. And, and, and it's particularly significant in a country like Nigeria, which is one of the largest, most populous. Yeah. And unfortunately, it has been a country synonymous with uh, corruption That's for many right. years. That is right. And this is the thing people figured, well, they take the money, they'll give you a little bag of rice, a little um, platitudes when the election comes, which they call it the uh, electoral business cycle, business as usual, you, you give them some little bribes and then they forget the stuff and then you're back in power. Now it looks like we might actually have credible opposition regardless of who's in power. And so they need to take the voters into consideration and the kind of policies they enunciate. There is some pressure, let's just say, where it never existed before. And that gives me a uh, cause for optimism. And all we need to do now is to reinforce that, uh, improve the voter registration, uh, the voter registrar, people's awareness and sustain it, you know, and let them actually come back to grass, uh, grassroots level and appeal to the voters. Maybe you might get water and the rural roads and the electricity, some of those basic infrastructure happening the way it's supposed to happen, rather than people stealing public money and taking it overseas and impoverishing the entire continent as it went. Is there any role do you think that the developed world, the West in particular, can play in, in, in this regard? Thank you for asking that question. That's actually the message that we uh, hope to uh, get across here, it takes two, because the destination of the stolen money uh, resides overseas in the developed countries. And because they play by the legal rules, the gatekeepers, the, the money launderers, uh, assure these criminals that their money is going to be saved. They'll uh, make sure that they clean them up separate the crime from the crime proceeds and make sure that the criminal has unfettered access to his funds. So trying to trace, freeze, identify, and repatriate those funds is a cumbersome problem. If we can solve that, it changes the game. 
because the incentives of uh, becoming a politician is no longer the fastest way to get wealthy and keep it. If you steal but you can't keep it anymore, what's the point of the, of the effort? You, know, uh, you can keep it while you're in power if you have the immunity, but as, long, as soon as you're out of power, if people can point to where it is and it's all gone, and perhaps you might even go to jail to boot. And that's clearly a, 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 a role that uh, Western governments have to play, has to be because uh, a bank will happily take that money if they, they're not you know, given right. any um, um, right. option, or, or if, they're, if, if they happily can bank that money and are not being supervised, yes. then they, they won't do anything about it themselves. That's right. And the UK has taken a very uh, strong step in that direction in actually prosecuting um, uh, public uh, people who have stolen public money. Uh, putting them in jail and going after those involved in the criminal enterprise. Have, have any other countries followed suit? How, how have the The Americans U.S., done? the Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Unit, which is a, a special unit in the U.S. Department of Justice, has also been helping with the confiscation, uh, confiscation of the assets of some of these convicted public officials. Because conviction is one part, making sure that you do not enjoy the process is the other. It's actually the stronger bite. Uh, because the evidence, uh, it's been documented even by the World Bank, that a criminal will go to jail for a long time to protect his or her asset. But if you strip that from them, that's where it bites most. You know, so it becomes like a wasted uh, labor. <laughs> now, you mentioned the World Bank, uh, and um, that brings me to the question of uh, other forms of Western aid. There is a school of thought, of course, which says, uh, not that I agree with it, but you know, that you have uh, uh, so much political dysfunction. There are so many failed states that uh, foreign aid is useless. It's only going to go to these uh, kleptocrats who are just going to take the money and recycle it back right. abroad. Yeah. Well, what's your assessment of that? Yeah. Well, it's true. It used to happen that way. But if you break the cycle, what happens then is if you begin to grab everybody in the criminal enterprise uh, value chain, the bag man, the, uh, the lawyer, the banks, as they have done with some of the large banks in the U.S. that uh, um, tried to do business with some of the countries that are on the United States Treasury blacklist. You know, they get into trouble. So if uh, there is a concerted effort um, by the Western nations to watch these uh, recycling um, um, dynamics, it's going to cut it off. I mean, the Title III of the U.S. Patriot Act was an example that outlawed shell branches. Um, and they said the U.S. will not allow any bank that does business with a shell bank to clear its check through a New York clearing house. That's a big deal. It literally killed all the shell branches. Well, it, and, and it, it also prevents money from going to these uh, people who would be expropriating the funds. But how do you help the citizens of these failed states? Because clearly there, there are a lot of people that are in these countries that are suffering and um, are, are, are the biggest victims yeah. of this failed governance. External agents of restraint can be very important. Um, you were just talking about the success of the Nigerian election. But what we don't know are probably the silent heroes, people who went around telling them to do the right thing. It's remarkable. It was the first time the president of the U.S. made a broadcast to the people of Nigeria. You know, we shouldn't forget that part. And I'm, I believe that even before that broadcast, they've been working tired, tirelessly behind the scene to make sure that the country doesn't implode. They even had conferences, I heard, from, uh, with both of the top contending candidates you know, asking them to pledge that they are going to tell their guys or their parties um, and girls to uh, make sure that this is a peaceful election and people don't turn it into another um, unfortunate example as you had in Kenya. You know? Yes. Uh... So, so to the, the point I'm making here is there is a lot. We're, we're a community of nations now, and there's a lot to be done. You know, a little nudge here and there, people say, look, do the right thing and we're watching. It can be very helpful. I've traveled a lot to uh, Africa, particularly Southern Africa. Um, uh, one of the great success stories has been uh, Botswana. Now it's a, it's a, it's a small country, mm -hmm. six million people. Uh, but they seem to have done a very good job in husbanding their resources mm -hmm. and uh, for, for broader public purpose. Are they a model or the, uh, are there some unique circumstances mm -hmm. which make uh, Botswana uh, you, uh, uh, unusual? Well, but so on, you know, there's also serendipity. <laughs> you know, South Africa had a Mandela. Yes. You know, if he was, an, probably if he was another uh, freedom fighter of a different cut and mold, maybe things wouldn't have been the way it was. So we're lucky to have Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and Oliver Tambo, those guys leading ANC at the time. You know, um, the same things, um, Botswana, 
just you know became nature probably blessed them and giving them leaders at the critical time that were public regarding you know and um, perhaps even Congo if Patrice Lumumba you know things had happened us, otherwise yeah. maybe also yeah. uh, that country that's chock full of resources is, you know more so every square meter than probably any other country in the world probably would have had a different story. So in Botswana's case, I, would, I said they've been very lucky and they've sustained it. Uh, I don't think it's about getting the governance institution right. It's, it's not about even being a small country because there's been other small countries that did make it. Um, but Botswana is also an example uh, that typifies you do have what an enlightened I, leader that it shows what you can but do. But it typifies with also what I told you about regional blocks that standing on your own, even if you get everything right. It's not sufficient. They need to be a critical mass. Because if, if South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, Zambia, and all those countries were manufacturing and trading, the momentum will pull. You know, the Botswana, so, because most of those factories might locate in Botswana, you know, because of maybe the specific business, a unique business climate that they offer. It might be a financial center at the time. But without these things happening, just standing by yourself, it becomes very difficult. Now, you're, you're a professor at the University of Cape Town. What's your Graduate sense? School of Business, yeah. yeah and and what, what's, what's your uh, uh, sense of what's happening in South Africa? Uh, uh, Mandela was a once-in-a-generation, maybe no, once-in-a-lifetime leader. Um, um, the, his successors have not maybe been quite up to the mark, if you want to be polite about it. That's right. Uh, it is unfortunate because... Um, he to which much is given, much is expected. We hoped that South Africa had an initial takeoff point, and then the point in which it was just a little nudge to make it in the transition into uh, pull the rest of the region along and make it into a developed country. You know, at least call it a diversified economy, economic transformation, social transformation. But uh, it had not happened that way because I think in many ways. The ANC has been cut off from being a liberation party to a political party. They've not quite made that transition, and it's taken longer than it should. And because we don't have a credible political opposition, uh, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That seems absolutely. to be an important consideration everywhere. I mean, you mentioned it earlier in Nigeria. You, you, have, a, you have two viable political uh, factions, which no. seems to be uh, an important uh, it, means it of helping the system evolve in a is. productive direction. Because people can't help themselves. Yep. Isn't that what they say about the Wall Street bankers? Yep. They say, <laughs> we can't help somebody <laughs> needs to restrain us, which is greedy. And I've watched some of the uh, movies they've had on Wall Street. And this is, we can't help ourselves. You know, somebody needs to look us over. It's just in the nature. So if you have a, a, an uncontested political space, uh, it's, very, it's very easy to become complacent and take the polity for granted. So we do need credible opposition. And this, uh, where you have a, the, where it's a toss-off who's going to win, is always very important for people to really be on the job and work very hard. If you think that you're always going to be voted in, you know, uh, perhaps because of historical antecedents or because of the distribution of the, vo the sentiments in the voting population, you begin to take them for granted. You know, so you do, and that's what I'm th hoping has happened in the case of Nigeria, that the fact that they knocked off an incumbent party will make them think twice. That people can realign the coalition I'm bringing a new group. And it was a coalition, and it didn't break down on tribal or geographic no. grounds the way it had in the past. So it is quite a hopeful development. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, maybe on that uh, note of uh, optimism, yes. we should uh, end it. Uh, Melvin Ayogu, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming to speak to us today. And thank you for giving me the chance uh, to share these thoughts with, uh, with the audience.